Hey what's going on gamers, here goes another update video of my NES game that I've been developing for a while. As usual you can download it for free from my itch.io page, the links are in the description. So you probably already can see the first change here in the screen. Just like games in the arcades, my game now will show off the intro cutscene. All you need to do is just wait a little. Of course it would have been nice to show off the gameplay as well, but it was a little bit too much for me. So at least for now it is just the intro. Since we started with the intro cutscene I should definitely mention that I spent majority of my time reworking the cutscene system. My main motivation was to make the evil ending more different than the regular one. As you know, uh, the so-called evil ending happens when you kill one of the villagers. Up until now I just played a different music tune during this ending. But I wanted to add some additional scenes that would make this ending look actually distinct. At first I thought maybe I should show blood on protagonist hands. But after some thinking I decided not to, because who knows how it might look like. Since the game resolution is so low and I also use the same three colors for everything. So on a CRT TV using uh, the composite signal it might look like some dirt or something. So what should I show instead? I know, let's show the protagonist being arrested. The background tile set for the cutscenes was kind of already full, so what I had left was the sprite tile set, which had a lot of free space. I just had to move some tiles around, put some of them closer together, and maybe remove some duplicated ones. I also had to create a meta sprite bank for the cutscenes, which apparently I didn't have before. This way I could preserve the original pictures and I could easily export them as assembly code for the cutscenes. Then I just drew this picture where a policeman is busting our main guy. Since I'm going to draw this with sprites only, this picture could not be wider than 8 tiles. Ok, I finally exported this masterpiece as an assembly data. Now what? Before I could actually see this picture in my game, I had to do a lot of work. You see, my cutscene system was very limited. It could only display a single sequence of scenes. Previously, when I tried to make the ending cutscene, I just shamelessly duplicated the intro code and just inserted different data. But now I wanted to make the system more proper so that I could have a list of possible cutscenes and I could just simply specify which one to play. So for that I had to create an entirely new data structure. Nothing too fancy, just a list of pointers that would point to another list of pointers, which would then point to the cutscene data. Obviously I had to remove the duplicated routines for the ending. The routines that remained had to become more complex, since now I have to deal with a bunch of pointers instead of simple data arrays. Once the job was done, all I had to do was to set the right cutscene index. For instance, 0 is the intro and 1 or 2 are the endings. Finally, I could test the evil ending and see how my new scene looked like. Yep. Luigi is busting Mario. Perfection. My game got pretty buggy over time, as you might have noticed, with every update I break something. <laughs> so now I wanted to fix some of the bugs I had left, at least the most annoying ones. There was a particularly nasty one, where the camera would start shaking if you kept running into an obstacle. This bug usually manifested if there were a lot of animals around. So why did it happen? Apparently the culprit was the collision detection code. 
So it would go like this. The game would back up the current player coordinates. Then these current player coordinates would be modified depending on the direction the player was going. Then the game would start checking if the hero collided with the environment or with one of the animals. If a collision was detected, the backup coordinates would be restored. And if not, the game would keep the modified coordinates. I'm not sure why I made it this way, because I never used this type of movement logic for my older games. Well, although everything was fine at the beginning. But unfortunately, as the game logic became more complex and it took more time to execute it, the non-maskable interrupt was executed during the collision check and it updated the stuff on the screen using the modified player's coordinates. And that's why you see that the player character moves forward a few pixels, then falls back and the process repeats until you release the d-pad. What can I do to fix this? Perhaps I can optimize the NPC logic or the collision check. I kinda try to simplify the code and reduce assembly instructions in it, but I quickly realized that it's not that easy. So I came up with another solution. What if instead of backing up current player coordinates and restoring them after a collision is detected, I could simply make a copy of these coordinates, modify them, check for the collisions, and if all is well, I could assign this copy to the current player coordinates. If the NMI is called during this process, it would still use the unmodified player coordinates to update the sprites on the screen. What a surprise, everything went really well. No more shaking. And I was kinda mad that I haven't wrote the movement code like this from the get-go. I also tried to improve the projectile collision. Before you had to be very precise while shooting with a slingshot. Now I have made the hit detection a bit looser. So it should be less frustrating trying to hit bunnies with your shots. I made a quite a few changes to the UI. I don't remember if I mentioned it before, but when you build things or cook food, the time actually passes in the game. So I thought it would be really nice to have the same daytime indicator inside the menu screen. Unfortunately, it was quite difficult to put it there because a frame this indicator had was strictly designed for the status bar and it would look quite ugly inside the menu screen. And if I remove this frame entirely, the sun and moon movement would look really weird. And I definitely did not want to add any additional UI tiles because I already had a bit too many. Somehow I came up with a solution for this problem. I've created a frame for this indicator from existing wood tiles. And I must say it doesn't look that bad. While tinkering with the UI, I finally managed to get rid of those two annoying tiles that I had to put in every tile set. And even the status bar went through some transformations. I moved the sprite zero to the very far right side of this bar. And it seems by doing this, I no longer need to wait for the TV scan lane to hit this sprite to keep this bar in place when the screen is crawling. So when I removed the code that was doing the waiting, the game magically started working on these ancient and inaccurate emulators I mentioned before, like Nesticle or the NES emulator for the Nintendo DS. They used to give me a black screen after the intro cutscene, but not anymore. So I guess that was a small victory for me, because now I can play the game on my DS Lite. The second noticeable UI change in the menu screen was the item progress bars. Not sure if you know this, but the tools and weapons in the game have a limited use and also some food items can spoil. But up until this point it was impossible to tell the state of an item without using the debugger. So I added two sprites next to the item picture. 
One was for the the bar itself and the second one which had the same color as the background supposed to cover the part of this first sprite and create an impression that the value of this progress bar is changing. I also reduced the maximum HP of an item from 100 to 64 because it's way more convenient to have a power of 2 number since the normal division on 6502 CPU can be really slow. So thanks to this change in order to calculate the second sprite's position I only need to shift the bytes of the item HP value to the right three times and add it to the sprite's origin. Unfortunately, to give the second sprite the background color, I had to sacrifice one of the four sprite palettes. So I rubbed other sprites in the menu screen of color red. Now as you see, the berries are gray. Although with a composite video signal, it might seem that there is still a color left there. Lastly, I just had to expand the world a little bit more. I added a branching path in the second dark cave, which leads you to a clearing where you can gather some wood. And when you have enough sticks, you can continue your journey down to the alien base level. There I've put another locked door, which leads you to yet another house instance where you can sleep, cook food and craft stuff. I don't know, this might seem weird, like who would put a room down there in caves? And like how the heck the smoke from the fireplace goes outside. Even though I've added some new rooms, I still have a lot of free space in the cartridge's ROM. So I guess next time I will try to probably add more new animals or maybe new enemies in the alien base to use up the space. Also now I must fix this new bug where the music starts with an annoying fart when you go from one location to another. I somehow haven't managed to fix it yet. So if you're curious how it will go and you don't want to miss my next video then please subscribe the channel. As usual huge thanks goes to the awesome channel members. Retro Sorcus, Tim Beimer, Christopher Vigren, Mr. Kesha and Saygreen. I'm really grateful for your support. So that's all for now. Thank you for watching till the end and I will see you in a next one. Bye bye.